Hello and welcome to the Ohio Health EMS Grand Round Series. My name is Eric Cortez. I serve as the System EMS Medical Director for Ohio Health. Our topic today is heart failure, and we're joined by our uh, colleague, Dr. Bruce Fleshman. He's an interventional cardiologist with Ohio Health. And he also serves as a special medical advisor and educator for Ohio Health EMS. And we're going to be discussing heart failure today. Dr. Fleshman, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. We'll jump right in, and I'd like to present you with a case that's pretty typical in the out of hospital environment. And we'd like to hear your thoughts about the patient presentation and with a special focus in on heart failure. So, our EMS personnel would typically get called on, let's say, a 55 year old male with difficulty in breathing. Uh, when our personnel arrive on scene, they note that the patient is having shortness of breath. The patient states that the shortness of breath is worse at night and when he lays flat on a flat surface. He's noted some mild swelling in his right and left foot uh, feet, and uh, he has a past medical history of COPD, high blood pressure, and he states he has a history of CHF that he's been told he has from his primary care physician. On EMS personnel exam, they note some crackles in bilateral lung fields and some swelling in the lower extremities. They also noticed uh, some JVD in the patient's neck. So at this point, our EMS personnel have to make decisions about potential causes of the patient's difficulty in breathing, uh, an assessment and a differential diagnosis as well as treatment decisions as well. So I'd like to hand that case over to you and get your thoughts about the case and heart failure in particular. Okay, great. That's a great case presentation. So a couple different things as you're going in and you get this history from the patient. The patient mentioned that they have a history that was given to them by their primary care of heart failure. And I always look at heart failure as a clinical diagnosis. And what you have to look at is what really is the definition of heart failure? I usually ask the residents to that definition and they all say, oh, well, it's the systolic thing or this diastolic, and they end up getting kind of confused on what really is the definition. And I try to basically put it down into one sentence, and that is heart failure is the inability of the heart to keep up with the metabolic demands of the body. Now that includes a whole spectrum of different things, but simply put, that really takes care of all the different causes of heart failure, and we'll, we'll get into some of those. The present, so the fact that they were told they have heart failure, the patient has no idea what kind of heart failure, what, what, what they have in general, but it gives you a little clue that maybe they've had this before. I think what's important when you're evaluating the patient is first and foremost find out, is this brand new? Have they ever had this before? If they said, yes, they had this before, and the pay, and that's what the doctor was treating for, that gives you a little bit of more confidence that it's not a sudden actual emergency as opposed, uh, doesn't necessarily mean they're not gonna go to the hospital, but it's, it's not a life-threatening situation. If it's brand new, you have to think about what other causes can happen. One of the things that you gotta ask is, were they having any chest discomfort at the time or do they have any uncomfortableness? Because certainly if they're having a big enough infarct or if they had one last week, you could have found out So they said, no, I don't have chest discomfort now, but last week I had this bad episode when I was shoveling snow and they could have had an infarct and now have a post-infarct complication of congestive heart failure. So knowing the acuity, knowing the history and asking questions of what has happened before. Other questions that you could ask is if they've ever had a heart murmur, if they've ever had certainly any other heart conditions, or if they have a family history of anybody that's had something similar to this. So that gives you a little bit of a clue, because when you're looking at a differential diagnosis, you, you have to, you first have to say, yes, this is heart failure by the clinical features, and which I think there's no question that we all can say that that's what it is. And the, um, Differential would therefore include anywhere from pericardial disease, okay, to coronary disease, which I just mentioned, either from a recent infarct or they could have had past infarcts and have an ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, 
or there could be other myocardial disease process. They could have a dilated cardiomyopathy, an alcoholic cardiomyopathy. They can have a, um, they could be an atrial fib. So it's important for you to go ahead and get a, uh, an EKG when you're talking to them with, and with your vital signs to know whether or not they have a tachycardic induced cardiomyopathy or evidence of heart failure. Um, you should listen to their heart, right? Because if they have a heart murmur and end up having a aortic stenosis, that makes a difference in how you're going to manage that patient. The other things that certainly can affect it, sepsis can affect it. Um, uh, Anemia, if they had a hemoglobin of six, they can go into heart failure the same way. But why? Because the heart's not being able to keep up with the demands of the body. And it keeps working and working. It can't keep up, can't deliver the oxygen, and you, they subsequently develop uh, volume overload. So those are a, a lot. That's a lot of information, but just little things to think about when you're evaluating this patient. The other thing is, once you get there and they complain of these things is, how do you treat that patient? So, it, again, it all depends on all the different things that go along with it, right? So, we, talk, we can also talk about a hypertensive cardiomyopathy. If their blood pressure was 220 over 120, you can give them a nitro and you can take, help try to take care of their blood pressure to see if we, that would help as far as that's concerned. One of the, if, if they were foaming at the mouth, <laughs> one of the old things we used to do, you, the most important thing and, and is why, why do they foam at the mouth or why do they have trouble breathing when they lie flat? Well, again, you never think of gravity working against you, but when you're sitting up, the fluid's down in your butt and legs. And then when you lie down, it all comes back into your chest, towards your heart. And if your heart can't handle the load, it ends up pooling in your lungs, making you short of breath, making you have to sit up. And if it's severe enough, you start coughing up frothy sputum. The old fashioned way for acute pulmonary edema, if the patient was worse, is, is rotating tourniquets. It's a simple thing to decrease uh, volume load to the heart temporarily until a diuretic takes, uh, takes place. Because you give Lasix, what does Lasix do? It first venodilates, and then 20 minutes later, you get the diuretic phase. So. You, you try to do things to temporize and make the patient more comfortable when you're evaluating them. That was excellent, Dr. Dr. Fleshman. Um, whenever EMS would encounter a person like this, certainly heart failure, I would hope, would be on the top of the list of uh, possible causes of the patient's symptoms, signs and symptoms. Do you have any tips or tricks for how clinically we can maybe lean more towards heart failure rather than pneumonia or COPD in a patient with risk factors for pneumonia and risk factors for COPD exacerbations? How can we differentiate those, those types of uh, causes of respiratory distress clinically in the field? Sometimes that's hard because people with COPD can't lay flat anyhow. But pretty much what I was mentioning before, if you go into a house and they're coughing and bringing up sputum or having difficulty breathing, but yet they're comfortable lying flat, that tells you that that's more of a lung problem than a cardiac problem. Again, when you're laying flat and if your O2 saturations are 85%, you would not be, if it was due to pulmonary edema or fluid overload in the lungs, you'd not be able to, you'd not be able to um, lie flat at all. You'd have to be sitting up in order to breathe better. So that that's certainly one of one of the ways. Neck veins it would not be that helpful because a lot of people with COPD and chronic disease may have some elevated uh, right sided pressures and pulmonary hypertension. So sometimes that could be a little bit tricky in looking at that. But I I think uh, the the orthopnea is probably one of the better evaluations that you can do to try to help you out. Certainly also listening to the, the cardiac exam for a significant heart murmur might also help. Thank you. Um, another area where there's some confusion with heart failure, and it's hard to keep some of the terminology straight. You know, sometimes we hear it described as uh, acute versus acute on chronic heart failure, systolic versus diastolic, right versus left. 
And then there's this new terminology that I've been noticing the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction versus reduced ejection fraction. Can you maybe touch on those terms and highlight some important points for our pre-hospital personnel? Well, I'm on your side is that I'm just as confused with all this terminology. <laughs> <laughs> That's but, that's very reassuring to hear because I was starting to doubt myself. So, <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing is that there's a lot of times renaming the same th thing that we already have named. Okay, so when somebody comes in with a dilated with uh, the diagnosis of a dilated cardiomyopathy, that means the heart's enlarged and they have a decreased ejection fraction. So, what's another diagnosis for that? Heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. What's another? You know. If they have the, had this diagnosis for a long time and then they come in and they can't breathe suddenly, that's an acute exacerbation on chronic heart failure. So the, the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is, is I, I kind of agree, gets kind of confusing, but it just means that they have systolic dysfunction and the acute and chronic just happens to know. And that's what you, again, from a history standpoint, you have to know. Has this patient truly been diagnosed with this? That's where you get the acute on chronic versus acute that's never been diagnosed before or a chronic, and it's just a little bit worse, okay? Now, when we talk about the other part of the differential is uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Basically, that's the new thing in the past few years was called diastolic dysfunction. And what that implies is when it's heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, your ejection fraction is normal. So it has normal squeezing out, but it can't relax properly. And when it can't relax properly, the end diastolic pressure or the pressure inside the heart goes up and it then tends to cause the pressures in the left atrium to go up and therefore may cause fluid retention or uh, overload into the lungs and maybe eventually down on the right side. What do we see heart failure with a reduced, you know, when we look at the differential of heart failure in general, when, and we look at the myocardial causes, you have the dilated cardiomyopathies. And again, those are systolic dysfunctions. That's heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, all the same thing. You have ischemic cardiomyopathies, just like the one I kind of alluded to with that first patient. And that's just the etiology of somebody that's had enough infarcts that their systolic function is again reduced, okay? And I, again, I don't like to use that term reduced ejection fraction because it doesn't give you a good etiology to the diagnosis. So I'm again with you, Dr. Cortez, that there's so many terms that are confusing. I like to stay specific so we know exactly what we're talking about. You have an alcoholic cardiomyopathy, which is a decreased ejection fraction from alcohol. You have you have um, Takasubo or the stress-related cardiomyopathy due to uh, the broken heart syndrome, uh, typically. You, um, you have restrictive or infiltrative diseases. Those are things like amyloidosis or sarcoidosis. And what happens is the amyloid infiltrates into the muscle. Most of the time in amyloid, you have a normal systolic function, but it cannot relax properly and the pressure goes way up inside the left ventricle, causing heart failure. Again, it's better to call restrictive lung uh, heart disease as opposed to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction because it does not really help you get a good diagnosis. Another cause for heart failure with preserved and probably the most common causes that I see with heart failure with preserved ejection fractions are two things, chronic hypertension and chronic atrial fibrillation. And the chronic atrial fibrillation is interesting. You don't really know whether it's a diastolic problem from the ventricle or if it's a left atrial disease that we really haven't defined. But either way, that is heart failure clinically from a preserved ejection fraction. So just to recap, just like you said before, I totally agree that that uh, the terms are getting a little bit out of hand or we're getting too many. when. You know, we now on our charts have EPIC and going to EPIC, you see all those diagnoses that you just mentioned, all of them on the same patient. And then you don't say, well, what's wrong with the patient? It still doesn't tell you 
what caused any of it. And so that's why I think we, we get out of hand with all this terminology. Well, that makes a lot of sense. And I appreciate you elaborating on those terminologies. And I, I'm a fan of your simple definition of, of heart failure. And I think that's great for our EMS personnel just to remember that. And it helps streamline things in, in the out of hospital environment where our personnel need to make very quick decisions with limited information. So I, I, I find that very helpful and I'm sure our personnel will as well. You mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, nitroglycerin for the treatment of heart failure. A lot of EMS protocols will emphasize non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. And most of the time that is CPAP when indicated for respiratory distress and nitroglycerin. Can you comment on how nitroglycerin works in heart failure and why it's important to give? Yeah, the, the nitroglycerin works in two ways. One was the example I used was more for the hypertensive patient. But what, what nitroglycerin does more than anything is it venodilates. And when it, it venodilates, uh, then it redistributes the fluid distribution. So it will decrease the volume going to the lungs. That's why when you give it in a patient that's having chest pain and they drop their blood pressure, a lot of time, if they're a little bit volume depleted, that venodilatation will cause their, their blood pressure to go down and you have to give a fluid bolus. So that's the main reason that we give it is really just to try to venodilate, redistribute the volume to, to uh, keep it from the lungs. Another um, area of, of heart failure that is sometimes discussed is is the so-called hypotensive heart failure or uh, cardiogenic shock rather than your hypertensive heart failure, which I think in the out-of-hospital setting, we typically will see hypertensive heart failure and normal tensive heart failure much more commonly than somebody that's hypotensive. Um, that can be really hard to identify in the out of hospital setting as well. So do you have any pointers for how do you recognize you know, hypotensive heart failure versus all the other causes of shock that we see that are likely a little bit more common in the out of hospital environment? And what recommendations do you have for treating somebody in heart failure that could be hypotensive? Run. <laughs> <laughs> Great, you know, if you bring up a good point, that you actually mentioned a little bit earlier. And one of the, the whole thing that the medics have to get used to, just like we have to get used to, and that's recognizing somebody that's sick. You know, that just takes the more people you see, the more sick people you see, the more people you can see that are sick. And so that's the same, same with us. And that is when you see somebody and you get this gut feeling, that something's going on, you have to you have to go with that. I think that's really important, whether or not uh, it's COPD, whether or not they need CPAP for ventilation. So those are all things you need to go through. When you're looking at somebody that's hypotensive and you don't know whether it's hypotensive and cardiogenic shock, you have to look at their peripheral perfusion, right? So if their blood pressure is low, are they cold? Are they clammy? Okay. Um, Again, it, it all depends on what the etiology for that is. Can they lay flat? It, it's the same kind of question because if they're in shock, they should start going into pulmonary edema because they're not able to get enough cardiac output and and um, start developing start developing that. But most of it is cold, clammy, uh, decreased mentation, and the, really the only thing you're going to be able to do is pressors if it's uh, due to cardiogenic shock. And unfortunately, if it's in a chronically heart failure patient, that's not a good prognostic sign. They're going to get renal failure and they're going to end up, you know, not making it. But but uh, hopefully you're not going to see a lot of those. Uh, the other obvious cardiogenic shocks are with infarcts. And that's a little bit different, though, too, because they have a mechanical reason why they're suddenly going into shock and you'll be able to recognize that, and they just need all the support you can get till they can get to the lab to open up a vessel. So, I don't know if that was very helpful, but <laughs> that's a tough one. No, that, that's a tough one, and that's definitely probably one of the, uh, probably one of the most acute patients that we'll encounter in the out of hospital environment, and that was helpful, thank you. Um, another question that I have for you is, uh, 
having heart failure in general, rather than just the acute presentation of new onset heart failure or, or an acute on chronic presentation, taking the chronic heart failure patients that, that we see, what are they at risk for that our EMS personnel need to be made aware of? So if somebody with heart failure has a syncopal event, what are we looking for? Are they at an increased risk of thromboembolic disease or dysrhythmias or renal failure or electrolyte abnormalities? What are your thoughts on that? Probably with the chronic heart failures, and we're talking primarily chronic systolic heart failures, the most common increased risk that they're at is sudden death. So if they have a syncopal spell, you have to think about an arrhythmic origin for that. The other thing is, unless it was occurring with activity, that sometimes, again, with activity, they may not perfuse their brain as well, and they may subsequently get a syncopal spell. And probably one of the more common things is they may get orthostatic hypotension and syncopal spell because they may either be dehydrated, their blood pressures may be low, and then they change position or they get up to start walking, they drop their blood pressure, they don't get enough blood flow to their brain, and they have a syncopal spell. Certainly from, a, you know, I think a lot of these chronic people, you would know whether or not from a thromboembolic uh, standpoint, if that was a problem at the beginning. So, so uh, we don't see that as much except in the very new uh, heart failure systolic dysfunction patients. With, with heart failure and heart failure medications, um, you know, what, what percentage of heart failure patients receive anticoagulation? Um, the antihypertensive medications that they're on, or maybe they're on the di digoxin or an antidysrhythmic like amiodarone. Should we be looking out for any medication interactions or specific side effects or adverse effects from the medications that heart failure patients are on? That's a good question. You know, most you know, medications that heart failure patients are on are, first of all, a beta blocker. And it's usually carvedilol or metoprolol succinate. Secondly, from a cost standpoint, it's a, an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, okay, the, which is the lisinoprils, the ramoprils, the losartans. And then next we have the new drug, Entresto, which is a combination drug, which I can't pronounce it. It's that Cabrecabritzel and uh, you know, <laughs> sartan. And that's actually been shown to be the best and better than the ACE inhibitors by themselves. And and um, so those are certainly drugs that uh, every heart failure patient should be on. The next set of drugs is the diuretics. So, you know, it's interesting. Not all systolic dysfunction, chronic heart failure patients need diuretics. They can take care of it with their diet, but sometimes they end up getting in an exacerbation, an acute thing, then they may need diuretics. But the chronic ones will end up also being on a diuretic plus spironolactone, okay? So if we just take those drugs by itself, some of the complications or some of the things that you might have to look for is either dehydration or hyperkalemia, renal insufficiency. So those are kind of things in the back of your mind you have to think about depending on what you want to do and what you want to give them or what their EKG looks like or what their presentation was. You then go down the list of medications, and the amiodarone is really given for the people that have had ventricular arrhythmias or subsequent atrial fibrillation. If they've had either of those, um, then they're going to be on amiodarone. If they had atrial fibrillation, they're also going to be on anticoagulation. So they can be on, as you just already alluded to, a whole list of medications, and certainly you have to look for their most common cause of death is sudden death. Number two is, is end-stage heart failure, where they just continue to go into heart failure and they can't get any better, and they go into renal failure. And then their other presentations include recurrent fluid overload and, uh, and like you said, syncope. So from, your, from a medication standpoint, it's just being aware what they're on and what could be some other causes to some other their, of their complaints that their heart, you know, they could be hypokalemic and their defibrillator went off, or they could have different things. So those are things for them to, to be aware of. Well, thank you, Dr. Fleshman. That was, that was really helpful. Um, I think some takeaway points that 
that I was able to write down that I think are very beneficial for our uh, EMS personnel is just your definition of heart failure was excellent it, and it keeps things simple and it, it allows us to, to, to evaluate the undifferentiated patient very effectively when we suspect that that patient could have heart failure. As with a lot of things in medicine, you know, the, the history and your physical exam are gonna both differentiate that, that patient with difficulty in breathing and lead you down the heart failure pathway. But as you alluded, it's gonna help you narrow down some of the causes and etiologies of that heart failure. Um, I think your points about nitroglycerin and the treatment for uh, hypertensive heart failure, especially uh, are very important and very applicable to the out of hospital setting. And uh, I appreciated your elaboration on um, basically heart failure patients are at risk for um, certain types of medical complications that if you didn't have heart failure, you'd have a much lower risk of having those things happen. And I think this was a lot of excellent information uh, for our EMS partners. So I want to thank you for your time. And uh, do you have any closing thoughts for us? No, I think you did a very good job in summarizing. Thank you so much, Dr. Cortez. It's always a pleasure being on this. I, I enjoy it very much. Yeah, we appreciate your time and your expertise, and hopefully we'll be able to get you back on shortly for another cardiology-related topic. For our listeners, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Ohio Health EMS. You can also contact me directly at eric.cortez at ohiohealth.com. If it is beyond my expertise, I can pass it along to Dr. Fleshman as well, and we'll be very responsive in getting back to you. So any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to reach out. Again, thank you for your time, and please continue to check out our website for uh, more and more educational content. Thank you.